Encounter is brought to you by the Broome County Council of Churches, where we connect compassion with needs as we inspire growth with dignity. You'll find us in special places throughout the community. For those who remain hungry, we provide meals. For those who are challenged, we build wheelchair ramps. We comfort those who are ill, minister to those who are confined, and we remain an advocate for change and understanding on behalf of every element of our community. Connect and inspire. Encounter the Broome County Council of Churches. Friends, welcome to the Encounter Program, sponsored by the Broome County Council of Churches. I am your host today, Mark Kimpland, and I am the senior pastor at the Endwell United Methodist Church. It's so good to have you with us, whether you're joining us uh, uh, via our TV show or over the radio. So good to have you all with us. We have an exciting show uh, today that I have been looking forward to, uh, to sharing our guest this morning is the Dr. Bruce Epperly, who is a pastor, a professor, a spiritual guide, and the author of over 60 books in the areas of theology, spirituality, healing, wholeness, scripture, and ministerial well-being. He uh, was one of the very first persons to teach courses in spirituality uh, in, uh, in the walls of medical schools, and he is retired. Uh, however, in that retirement, he is still active as a seminary professor, writer, and grandparent. Bruce, welcome back to the Encounter program. Uh, so glad you are with us today. It's good to be back again, and we're, we're making a habit of this, and it's always a great joy to be uh, with the folks in the Binghamton area to share good news. I'm looking forward in a few months to being up at Chautauqua Institution for a little uh, holiday. And, uh, oh, awesome. This is one of my favorite parts of the world, and seeing you is always a great joy. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate it. I, 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 I was thrilled about the topic today that you wanted to talk about when you reached out to me um, around the idea of religious pluralism, but in the backdrop of your uh, new book, uh, that is entitled The Elephant is Running, uh, published by Zachra Sage Printers. And thank you for forwarding that to me. It's an amazing piece of work. And I, uh, I'm i about to take a spiritual leave of four weeks um, at the end of July, beginning of August. And this is going to be on the top of my reading list. So I, uh, I was just thrilled with the topic and the way it's laid out and how you look at ways in which these, uh, uh, the different theologies and, and different religions can bless Christianity and Christianity bless them also. And I, I can't wait to dive into this. So let, let's start with the elephant in the room, pardon the pun. Um, but the elephant in the room is, uh, what do you mean when you say <laughs> the elephant is running? It caught my attention right away. Well, you know, I think in many ways, Mark, it is the elephant in the room. Uh, these days, pluralism and diversity are the elephants in the room. Uh, we know that the world is plural. We know that there's diversity, but yet we have concern about what it means to us moving forward in the future. Well, there is an old story, it apparently comes from Asia, but it's probably global in many ways, about a group of sight impaired or blindfolded persons who find themselves confronted by a strange creature. They each touch one part of the strange creature. One touches the trunk, one the ears, one the tail, and one the legs. And each one assumes that the creature is exactly what they're touching. One says, it's a fan. The other says, it's a pillar. Another says, it's a snake. Another says it's a rope. Each one assumes that their part of the elephant is the whole reality. And of course, this story was originally told to remind folks of to be more humble in their religious assertions, to not claim that the truth they have uh, includes all truths and denies others. Well, as I've been pondering this, and I've thought of this image for over a decade, uh, uh, this book began 10 years ago, when I was teaching a course on religious pluralism at the Claremont School of Theology in California. And I always have a subtitle for every course I teach. Yeah. Uh, and then 10 years later during COVID, I taught this at South Congregational Church on Cape Cod. 
the elephant in the room and the elephant is a story. If it's a living elephant, it's a moving elephant. Yeah. Who had what living thing stands still? A true elephant makes sounds that vibrate for for hundreds of miles. A true elephant is moving and breathing and sometimes charging and we have to hang on for dear life. And the true elephant, like the true religions world we live in, is on the move. Living religions are never static. An elephant never stands still. Living religions are static, they're growing, they're dying, they're living, they're changing, they're interacting with their environment. And that really is a place we find ourselves. Every religious tradition, even those that attempt to deny pluralism, attempt to deny diversity, attempt to deny change, in their very denial, they're recognizing the truths that they don't like. We live in a world of adversity, we live in a world of pluralism, we live in a world of change, and they influence us, whether it's just simply the two of us talking here on, on um, uh, via social media platforms, or whether it's picking up the paper or the news, discovering something about Ukraine or something about Somalia or even attack on the Capitol, we are no longer local people, we are global people. No Try as we might to deny history and pluralism, we, our denial is the revelation of it. Well, it's it, it was amazing as I was kind of perusing the book and such things. Um, it's moving. It, it's vibrant. It's um, uh, it, it's in motion. Our, our 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 truths, our religions, our denominations, and such things. But we try so hard <laughs> in, in in that scope to remain the same. Yes. It, it, to not change. Um, can can you reflect on that? Just just I, that was a, kind of a sidebar that I I well, picked it's up. an important sidebar because every religious tradition is dealing with this. Every religious tradition has a history. And the history is important in its self-definition. The history of Methodists is different than Presbyterians, than Southern Baptists. The history of creedal churches is different than non-creedal churches. How we celebrate the Eucharist and who we invite to it is different. Who's welcome in our church, whether we're open and affirming or closed toward LGBT communities. All these things represent a encounter between the present moment and past history. It's a little bit like our own lives. Uh, I was raised a Baptist in a fairly conservative household. I claim that as my history. I wouldn't be here as if I hadn't been there. I learned from the Baptists. I grew up with the power of prayer. I learned scripture and Bible drills and memorizations. But, and that I can't leave that behind just as we can't leave behind the Apostles' Creed and, uh, and the historic figures of the church. But they would feel, I think, that we would be betraying the faith if we just stood still. Mm -hmm. order and novelty, change and changelessness. So when we read the Bible, we, we have to see it now in light of global religions. We have to see it now in light of technology. Uh, the author of the creation stories in Genesis didn't know anything about the Big Bang Theory or the Hubble telescope, but they did have the wisdom to say that when we look at the universe, it's the result of divine intentionality, and it is good. And I think that order and novelty is so important. Yeah. Uh, the media medium is the message sometimes, and even the fact that we're talking here is very different than John Wesley <laughs> pilgriming through the United sure. States, stopping every five or six miles and planting a church. Yes. I have study groups where people from across the country attend. And, and this program, even though it's offered for for the New York area and in Western New York will probably be viewed by people across the country and maybe even Finland and Iceland and Japan. Yeah. Uh, and that changes the message. We have to be intimate and also infinite. We have to remember our past and yet lean toward the future. Yeah. And doing that's a very delicate dance. Um, it, 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 it takes intentionality, as, as you say. Uh, one of the things about your book that I, I found intriguing is your personal story. 
And, and you yeah. touched on that a little bit. And I thought that was intriguing because it's one thing to, um, to state the things you've been saying, but it gets personal to you. Uh, and, and, and there's a heritage there. Uh, can you kind of reflect on that a little bit as to how that's affected? Well, uh, yes. And I think that's true. The book in many ways is about my story and other people's stories because I interview about a dozen people from various religious traditions to tell what they think they should say to a Christian like myself. Mm -hmm. And they give their witness, and we need to listen to the witnesses from other faith traditions. But I was raised, as I said, a Baptist in small town America in King City, California, in the Salinas Valley in Steinbeck country, just across the, the hills from Carmel and Monterey. My father was a minister. It was an evangelical conservative church, and I learned a lot there. As I said, I learned the Bible. Uh, I learned to love the Bible. I, I was raised on Billy Graham crusades and revivals at our church every summer. And it seems like the Baptists always needed to be revived because we always had revivals. And I came forward, a good Baptist term for accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, at about 10 years old at a revival meeting with a cowboy evangelist, Leonard Eiler, who mm -hmm. sang about the roundup for God. He was apparently the cow evangelist to the, to the stunt doubles and extras and cowboy wow. stars down in Hollywood. And he wow. drove his Buick up to King City with a stack of books in it and Bibles and came for a week and souls were saved. Uh, by the time I was a teenager, the intellectual aspects of that faith no longer fitted. Uh, I don't know that there was a discernible moment where I said, this doesn't work for me. But literally, when I went into a church, and my father was no longer pastoring at the time, at least as a congregational pastor, I felt suffocated, mm -hmm. as if I was being squeezed. It was psychosomatic in the sense that our spirit affects our body, and our body affects our spirit. It was too small, and, and I was still that Baptist kid, and I probably still am that Baptist kid. But I was a Baptist kid who was seeking more light, uh, more light. And, and my heart, to use Wesley's language, was strangely warmed as I uh, read about the transcendentalists, Emerson and Thoreau, as I uh, read Walt Whitman, as I began as a teenager, maybe even 15 years old, to study Buddhism and Hinduism. To I grew up in the San Francisco area, so I was also involved in the Magical Mystery Tour of the time. Mm -hmm. and live to tell the story. <laughs> and these shaped a sort of an imaginative religion. Uh, when I was a college first year student, I went to an ashram in Berkeley, California, and, and um, uh, learned transcendental meditation. This was now 50 some years ago, 52 years ago in 1980, and I never looked back. Yeah. Three, two or three weeks later, I started going to church again. And I went to church at another Baptist church near the college campus that was was much more progressive, and it had two pastors in it, John Akers and Shorty Collins. Uh, John was a senior pastor, and Shorty was, they called him Shorty because he was six foot seven, uh, <laughs> was, was the Baptist college chaplain, retired, but still active. He sat in front of the Bank of America every Thursday protesting the Viet Vietnam War. He mm -hmm. canceled, canceled COs and draft resistors and whatnot. But these people saw something in me as a theologian and potential pastor. And, and that really set me on a course. And, and it took me a handful of years, I must say, to, uh, in, to rediscover my Baptist roots, which I denied, to reclaim some of my uh, youthful adventures, which I put in the background. And, and really, in a way, my spiritual health depended on me uh, taking seriously the mystics, uh, claiming my Baptist biblical background, and claiming the imagination that I learned in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, I'm still a growing Christian, mm. still a growing Christian. I don't see being a Christian as the beginning of, a, as the end of a journey, but the beginning of a journey. Uh, and my journey grows as I learn more things, and I learned a number of things writing this book. Yeah. Uh, I learned that people who are Confucians these days don't like to be called Confucians. Uh, they like to be called Ruists. Uh, mm -hmm. I learned that the, the Zoroastrian folks prefer to be Therathustis, 
uh, named after Therastastra, uh, rather than Zoroaster, which is a Greek term, and just as Confucius, Confucianism is a, an English term of Kung Fu Tse. And, and so I keep learning, and I, I learned this, my dear friend, uh, Cindy Simpson, who is a former student and employee of mine at Lancaster Seminary, said when we were talked about earth-based theologies, and she said to me, Bruce, you could be a witch too. <laughs> that was the first and only time I've ever been described as one, but as she understands what yeah. it means to be a pagan, it's not somebody with a pointy hat, but it's somebody who appreciates the feminine nature of God, yeah. who believes the seasons are filled with wisdom for us, and who believes the earth needs to be honored and prepared. Paganism isn't pagan, right. as, the, as many people have criticized it. It's the love of the earth. Yes. So I learned quite a bit in the process. Yeah, yeah. I encountered a uh, a Muslim who was a process theologian who was open to new ways of looking at Islam that were progressive. So yeah. some of my stereotypes got challenged. Sure. Oh, how exciting <laughs> that, that is. Thank you for sharing that. Um, friends, our uh, guest this, uh, today is uh, Dr. Bruce Epperly, and he's talking about uh, his new book, The Elephant is Running, as it relates to religious pluralism. So let me ask this, Bruce. Um, how have we done over the years, uh, historically, uh, with, with Christians relating to other religions, whether it's biblical, uh, positive, negative? Can you kind of give us a snapshot on that? Well, I can, and it's, it's a really surprising snapshot. <laughs> uh, the, the notion that no one comes to the Father but by me, and that Christians are the only ones saved or have the only uh, full, have the fullness or only truth to be that saving really doesn't uh, doesn't wash either in biblical history or in the history of Christianity. I, I've, again, in studying pluralism, the first thing I noticed was that Christians had to discern from the get-go what their relationship was to Judaism. Yeah. Were they merely a sect of Judaism? And a good many Christians, followers of Jesus, they weren't even known as Christians in those days. A good many followers of Jesus believed, as James of Jerusalem did, that you had to be a pious Jew in order to be a follower of Jesus. The Apostle Paul took a slightly different path, a little bit like my story of the Baptists. He never repudiated Judaism. It, it's, it's totally unfair to think that Paul has a, believed that Christianity superseded or, ne, or, or negated Judaism or notif, nullified it. He just saw that the Christians, especially in the Greco-Roman world, did not have to conform to Jewish law except in a few certain few areas, and they could live according to their culture. And Paul's progressivism on this point enabled Christianity to be a world religion. Well, of course, then Paul uh, speaks in Athens, and while he does claim that Christianity is the, the fulfillment of other religions, he does say that God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being, and that applies to everyone. Yeah, yeah. No one's left out. And, and so there is this strange interplay of particularism, Every religion has its own particularities. And universalism from the very beginning. And of course, what language do the, does the church use to describe itself? It uses Greek. And when you use someone else's language, you take on their conceptualities. You take on their way of looking at the world. So you could say that even the Christianity of the past 20 centuries and the creedal church of the 4th and 5th centuries was a type of marriage between Judaism, the way of Jesus, and Greek philosophy. Mm. And we're still trying to figure out that in our understandings of God and truth. Yeah. Oh, amazing. That, that is, that's, that's wonderful. Um, how, if we continue to struggle with it, and, and, and the idea of, of uh, religious pluralism um, within denominations, within our cultures, within uh, the, the world in which we live, uh, how do you see that we're being invited, we being Christians, invited to respond uh, to the other traditions? How, uh, which way and, and in what ways do we respond to them, um, as you outline in your book? 
Well, yeah, and, and there are ways that I feel are better and ways that I don't feel are quite as helpful. Okay. Uh, the, perhaps the, the least helpful way in a pluralistic age is to say that we have it and you don't. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I know when I was growing up as a college student, there was a campaign uh, put on by one of the in, in evangelical associations in California. It may have been cross country. The I Found It campaign. Mm -hmm. And it was, I found it, obviously you don't have it. And it spawned all sorts of humorous things. Uh, I found it and I stepped on it. And, and, and I never lost it uh, from Jewish folks and, and from those who were who were involved in the summer of love, I found it and I smoked it. Uh, <laughs> and the, the truth air position doesn't work. It doesn't work. Nor does interesting that the exact opposite that says all religions are the same mm -hmm. and that all religions are absolutely culturally relative and have nothing to say beyond their borders. Uh, I take a, a position that I call centered pluralism, and I didn't invent that term. It uh, was a term that, uh, that was originated when I was university chaplain at Georgetown to describe how they were trying to reach out. Yeah. But a centered pluralist is somebody who is deep in their own tradition, who takes seriously, if you're a Christian, the way of Jesus, is biblically astute uh, and critical as well as appreciative, who takes seriously what it means to be a follower of Jesus and yet recognizes that other paths are meaningful to other people. You don't try to argue that you're better than them. You try to say, this is what God has shown me. Yeah. It's a little bit like uh, marriage uh, in many ways. And I, I claim to be married for over 43 years. I think the 44th is coming up in January. Congrats. I love my wife like no other. But there are other women who are interesting and beautiful. But I'm faithful to my wife. There's truth elsewhere. But I'm faithful to this truth. But at the same time, I can learn from relationships to other people that are congruent with my relationship with my wife. I can learn to be faithful to my wife and learn from other people to tell me things would help me be a better person and maybe even a better husband. And the same for religion. I think that we need as Christians, first of all, to be humble. To yeah. recognize that we don't possess the whole truth. To claim you possess the whole truth is to be an idolater. Is to absolutize your viewpoint. To recognize we've made mistakes. Mm. Uh, when I was dialoguing with a first American or Native American, and what and each chapter has a section on what can we learn from other faiths and what can we share with other faiths. What Christians, I discern, can share with first Americans is confession. Mm. That is, confessing our sins of genocide. Yeah. Confessing our sins. We, ha we have very little to teach them or to replace them until we confess. To confess and know our history has been ambiguous. And then to share and listen and grow. A lot of people today are what they call interspiritual or have hybrid spiritualities. And they're probably people in all your churches, uh, even conservative churches. Sure. Uh, they may be worshiping at a church that calls itself Bible believing. And I'm a Bible believer, but that doesn't mean I'm a fundamentalist. Yeah. Uh, but Bible believing church, but do yoga. Yeah. Yeah, uh, or 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 a person in your uh, in your choir uh, of any church may have read something by the Buddhists, uh, like Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Buddhist sage, mm -hmm. and learned breath prayer as a way of centering themselves. Uh, no doubt, somebody in your congregation has learned uh, a, a, a form of holistic medicine that comes from another tradition, whether it be the exercises of Tai Chi or Qigong or the hands-on Reiki healing mm. touch. Uh, I think we are on a path of growth that enlarges. Yeah. Jesus, as the scriptures say, grew in wisdom and stature. And stature is the question of how big is your soul? I think you need a big soul I think as my friend and fellow author, Patricia Adams Farmer, a wonderful author, on, does some great work that's very aesthetic on the beautiful God, talks about fat soul theology. 
That is, you want a big soul and not a small soul. You want to grow in wisdom and stature. You never leave Jesus behind, but your Jesus becomes cosmic as well as local. Yeah. Oh, that's profound. Uh, friends, we have been blessed this morning uh, with uh, Dr. Bruce Epperly, um, who's sharing his thoughts on religious pluralism uh, relating to his book, The Elephant is Running. We've only got a few mo uh, minutes left, Bruce, but I, I, I'm intrigued um, with everything you've shared. And, but those that are listening and watching might be wondering, how do we understand then truth? How do we understand then salvation, you know, which yes. is the basis? Can you just spend a minute or so on that to unpack that for us? Well, yeah, that's such an easy topic. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think the first thing we need to, to, to say is that the fact that we don't know the whole truth doesn't mean there isn't a truth. Right. Uh, the truth is the God's eye view. The truth is the God's eye view, and it's the truth of this moment grounded in the past and moving toward the future. God is doing a new thing, as Scripture says. Behold, I do a th new thing. God's mercies are new ever, every morning, so that even God's image of truth is evolving. We can't capture it all, but we can move toward it. Uh, in the Christian tradition, there's the viewpoint that uh, we can have the truth, but the truth is beyond us. And that that keeps us humble, but we can proclaim our truth, not with our fingers crossed, but mm. to say this is saving. Now, I happen to believe that God uh, gives each one of us and gives the whole planet paths to salvation. No one comes to the Father, but by me may very well mean that God provides the way, the truth, and the life. And it may be, as we learned as Baptists, God has a personal relationship to us and to different cultures. You don't have to know everything to experience God's grace. Amen. And I think the ultimate test of grace is that can people who differ, who hold different views of the universe, of, of the spiritual goals, still be in God's grace? And God's grace doesn't depend on our works. It depends on God as the, you know, God's grace is prevenient. It comes before. It calls, and we respond, and God wants all of us to be part of this great family, this kingdom of God. Oh, man. Oh. I, uh, my, my dear friend, I, I look forward to my spiritual leave and uh, getting on this book and, and, and learning from it. Uh, your thoughts are profound, and uh, I, I thank you for the gift um, that you have brought us today uh, and, and through the pages of this book. So I, I just cannot uh, wait for this to begin for me uh, in, in, in sharing your thoughts. So uh, Dr. Bruce Epperly has been our guest, and thank you, Bruce, for, um, for doing this. Uh, certainly would love to have you back on the, uh, on the program again sometime real soon. It will uh, be a joy. That's, that would be fantastic. My dear brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us today on the Encounter program. Program. I hope your day is a blessing as you bless others.